Welcome to our webinar, Robots and Running Orders, as we discuss the emergence of artificial intelligence and machine learning in creative media. Chairing our panel is Dr. Rich Welsh, and he is joined by Dr. Yotta Georgia Kopelou, Dr. Yanis Andropoulos, and Yvonne Thomas. But first, to introduce the session is Sadie Groom of RTS Thames Valley. Uh, I'm Sadie Groom, I'm the Managing Director of Bubble Agency and I am also a committee member of the RTS Thames Valley Creative Technologies Centre. That's a bit of a mouthful, isn't it? Um, so at our event, um, and generally we really like discussing um, the creativity in the industry and also the combination of that with technology. So um, this session uh, is all about that. Uh, we're talking robots and running orders of but primarily around AI and machine learning. So I'm going to hand over to Rich Welsh, the SVP of Innovation at Deluxe. Thank you, Sadie. Good evening, everybody, uh, and welcome to this session on AI. Hopefully it'll be entertaining, uh, stimulate some questions and conversations amongst you, um, and, and hopefully you'll learn something about how we're uh, deploying AI in the media now uh, and, and what we're going to do with it in the future, what direction we're headed in. Um, I'm not going to spend time introducing the panellists. You can see their bios online. Uh, I'm sure you've read them all anyway when you were booking for the event. So um, without more ado, I'd like to um, go around all of the panel. Um, and first of all, to set the scene, can you tell me in one sentence, uh, what does AI mean to you? Uh, could we start with uh, Yotta? Could you, could you give me a, a, a one sentence take on AI? Okay, uh, one sentence is a bit hard, I'm not a scientist, but uh, AI is a complex representation of a problem uh, using millions of parameters that are organized in architectures of artificial neural networks. And these neural networks mimic what happens in the human brain, but in a simplified way. And once you train them, they can learn to represent the solutions to these problems. Uh, that humans face. In my field, I'm in media localization. Uh, these problems are speech recognition, speech synthesis, and machine translation. And the neural networks learn to represent these solutions from data that has been created or labeled by humans. In, in my case, that have been transcribed and translated by translators. Thank you. Uh, Yanis, could you, could you give me your definition of AI? What does it mean to you? Yes, hi, hi, Rich, hi, everybody. Um, thank you for having me today. Uh, I follow on from Yota's definition. So for, for us, uh, AI means typically a neural network uh, design that has been trained with what we call a set of cost or loss functions, right? Uh, that we're trying to minimize on our data. And, um, and it's designed to solve a certain specific problem, a certain domain specific problem. For example, mapping, uh, you know, uh, speech into text or something like that, right? And uh, typically, as Yota said, the design is based on a neural network training and millions, if not billions of parameters. Thank you. And Yvonne, what do you think of when we say AI? Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Fantastic to be here. Um, I think AI has quite a right range. Um, it can be from a very simple and very specific task that's being replicated in a very simple algorithm um, towards an, I would say, intelligent system that can even take very complex decisions and has some sort of an own uh, life and, and brain, if you want so, simply um, to what Yota and, and Yams were touching on, it's, it's a set of new, neural networks um, deeply integrated into systems. And therefore, I think we have the full uh, range of what can, AI can mean to us nowadays. And there's certainly a future perspective to it. Thank you, Yvonne. So with that, I'd like to, um, Yota, you, you mentioned um, natural language processing and, and translation and speech detection. Um, can we go fully automatic with that now? Uh, how important is it to keep a human in the loop or can we just let the AI work on its own now? Um, okay, that is a complicated question. And uh, I'm actually very honored to be in a panel to talk about AI when I 
am, I, I'm a translator myself. This is how I started, right? So I haven't studied anything to do uh, with computers, just languages. Um, so in media localization, um, the three technologies uh, that are key is speech recognition, synthesis, and machine translation. And the first two have been used already in the industry for about uh, two decades. But uh, speech recognition, has been used always with a, huge, with a human in the loop in live subtitling workflows. People will be familiar with live subtitling in the UK. They're normally done with we speaking when you have a person uh, speak and then the speech recognition output turns this speech into uh, subtitles, automated ones. And then a person is there to actually correct any mistakes uh, that the machine makes. These days, speech recognition for certain types of content has, uh, can produce a very near human quality uh, output. So there is experimentation to use it in fully automated workflows, as you suggested. And in fact, there have been cases where um, for broadcast news, for instance, we have reported uh, speech recognition fully automatically reaching the 98% NER threshold. Uh, and NER is the metric that's used in many countries, including in the UK, to judge the quality of uh, live subtitles. Uh, now the problem, um, it's, of course it's great news that speech recognition can do this, but the problem lies in the 2%. Uh, and we can't control what errors the machine can make in this 2%. So just to give you um, an example, I mean, people in the UK probably all remember, uh, especially from the previous decade, uh, a lot of subtitling blunders that would make the news because they were so funny. I mean, one I still remember that was my favorite was welcome to the year of the horse. And you had the animal horse, not spent, spelled as the animal, but as a homophone in the, in the subtitles. So that made the headlines. Uh, but the problem is not really these mistakes uh, uh, that uh, the AI makes, uh, because these are recognized by the viewers as errors, and that's why we laugh at them. The problem is the ones where you don't actually realize that they're errors, the ones that are plausible uh, and could even pose a risk to one's life. The deaf community refers to them as lies. Uh, so if you had a breaking news story and you had an instruction about using or not using a specific exit or gate and you had a number transcribed instead of 50, it said 15, that's serious. So that's the problem uh, with, with AI. Uh, so to your question, you know, if we can have, uh, if we can, you know, if we need a human in the loop, yes, we do unless the quality that's required in the end product is you know, less than perfect, or uh, unless we can come up with ways to mitigate the risks that may come from errors that the AI will make. For instance, you know, in the example I just mentioned, if automated subtitles are clearly labeled as automatic and prone to errors so that people know not to trust them fully, uh, then uh, that would be perhaps a solution. But other than that, we do need a human in the loop. And I've only uh, referred to uh, speech recognition because that's the most um, mature. There are some um, cases of speech synthesis that are becoming interesting, but that's a different, it's a different topic for discussion. Yeah, and we'll, we'll, we'll come back to that because I think that's definitely an area that we should, we should discuss. But uh, Yanis, the area that you work in is more around picture encoding, which um, I'm sure will be familiar um, as an engineering concept to many of our audience. Um, but what, um, what, do we, uh, what do we do to understand what the AI is doing in that scenario? Because we know picture encoding can be very important to uh, you know, downstream processes. So you know, can AI impact that? And, and, and do, we, do we have to pay attention to what the AI is doing? Can we even tell what the AI is doing? Yeah. Uh, yes, very important questions, all of them. Uh, maybe I can quickly say where I'm coming from. So I'm a professor also at University College London, and I also work at iSize, which is a deep learning startup working in optimizing video delivery uh, using AI, right, which is where the discussion is today. Um, so the, the work we do has to do with what I would describe understanding human perception. So the next frontier in optimizing video delivery systems, uh, in our view at least, and in the view of many of the experts worldwide, 
will exploit better understanding of human perception, uh, human visual perception. Uh, this happened in audio, for example, you know, 25 years ago with MP3, right? The psychoacoustic thresholding of MP3 that we uh, now use daily, even in this conversation and so on, to, to compress audio, remove massive amounts of information without impacting fidelity or impacting it in a very minimal sense, right? In the visual cortex of the human brain, uh, this is a much deeper problem because there's many more neurons and, and the visual system is massively more complex and less understood, right? Um, traditional handcrafted technologies in video have tried to do that for the last 50 years with more or less linear systems like transforms and quantizers and so on. And more recently, we're including AI uh, in a number of ways, both in the encoding, but also in the quality scoring. Um, what I would say for the questions is that uh, there's a massive number of solutions that can be proposed for AI pre-processing, which is what we do, plus AI encoding. To keep things stable, one has to use quality metrics that are well understood and well accepted by the community. And even more, that there are open source implementations that people can audit and, and, and agree jointly that yes, it is the correct software design, it is measuring in the way we accept and so on. And these implementations and these metrics have to be kept separate from what the AI is doing um, in, in, in optimizing, right? The reason I say that is because one, once one starts uh, saying, let me also create an AI metric that uh, begins to improve along the AI processing and encoding, you can cause a lot of limit cycles and instability in the process, right? That means, for example, that um, you, can, you, know, you can drive yourself into obscure cases of uh, enhancement, obscure cases of artifacts that somehow the metrics don't pick up because they align themselves to what the uh, uh, processing is doing, right? Um, so, and the last point to mention, like Yota said, is having the human in the loop. Uh, it's not enough, even if we trust the quality metrics, you know, highly, they're still myopic and we would need to have human viewers validating corner cases or some typical content um, and that is here to stay. Uh, the problem is also massively complex, of course, because we use many devices today, mobile phones, tablets, uh, you know, 4K TVs, all that kind of stuff, right? Um, yeah, so it's, it's a complex landscape. It's not only AI causing the complexity, it's the complexity of our lives as well, right? Our devices and the desire to improve things much rapidly, use more data, consume more video feeds daily and so on. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and that's interesting. I think you both said a very similar thing there about this, this kind of point of the 2% that cannot be perfect and that we have to have somebody uh, looking at that to, to kind of either catch it or fix it or understand what's going on there. Um, Yvonne, you work with broadcasters um, at, at, with, uh, at DTG and, um, you know, we see that there are areas that broadcasters are using AI at the moment, like uh, audience analytics, personalization, classification, um, and, and they're relatively mature and they're certainly commercial applications. Um, do you think that it, it's um, industrialization and monetization that's driving AI adoption? Would you, is that what you're seeing? Yeah, I would say always um, we would look for the technical benefits and obviously also further to the monetization. And this could mean several things. Um, this could be uh, a more efficient workflow or efficient ways uh, we use the human um, resource. Uh, but this could be also to enable new use cases and new offerings to the consumer. So both is actually possible. Um, where we see a big advantage using AI and machine learning, machine learning technologies, certainly in the area of personalization. Uh, and this mainly refers to the search and discovery. So, uh, you know, increasing the reach actually of content and make it discoverable is absolutely key. Um, and this is some sort of monetization actually of content. And this always comes back to creating metadata 
And we all know metadata is a very complex um, issue and certainly creating the metadata and reliable and high quality metadata is a task in its own. So, and this is also where, where AI can help to yeah, increase A, the speed to create those metadata, but also B, to create the quality of the metadata. Um, and this is touching on an aspect that Ayota mentioned already. This is cognitive services, um, which is a subset of artificial intelligence, um, whether it's speech recognition uh, or language recognition, whether it's face or object detection. So all sorts of ways that we humans see in our environment and judge on uh, recognizing or knowing this is a car, this is a person, this is a specific uh, celebrity. This is all based on how our brain work and based on our experience. This is how we can train a system and the system will learn um, and improve the quality of the metadata. And obviously, we humans aren't very good at processing huge amounts of data while the machine is, and that's where the advantage is. Um, of course, we as humans need to train the machines what they need to do and in which direction we want them to go and learn and, and decide. Um, but at the end, the, the actual processing is lots more efficient um, in the machine, certainly. So it, it requires some sort of human control at that point. Um, but yeah, this, this is an area where we think uh, search and discovery is super important, creating the metadata, and also for, for live sports events. If you think about segmentation of content, um, especially when they're highlights of a football match, you don't have much time um, to create this and it needs to be available seconds or just minutes after the match, then AI would help select the highlights. So it's kind of a pre-editing and it would be a lot quicker for the editor to um, edit the highlights and it's available um, right after the match. So this is yeah. one area. And that's, the second, oh, sorry, yeah, sorry, go ahead. No, I think the second is, is actually also what Janis was touching on. And, and he's definitely the expert, so I'm not going into this, but um, coding efficiency is something that's certainly interesting as well. Um, and another aspect, just to add to it, is, is probably also the, um, uh, the environmental aspect. So when coding becomes more efficient, then it's not just about increasing quality, but also um, reducing the carbon footprint. That's a really interesting point and, and something maybe we can come back and discuss a little bit more later. I would like to, uh, and, and picking up on all of the, uh, the things you, you guys have just said, uh, I'd like to come back to that later and look at um, you know, how we balance up um, the, the, how good the AI is versus the commercial aspects and then the ethical question of whether we should be replacing people with, uh, with these tasks. And in some cases, it's obvious that people couldn't do those tasks. Uh, but on the other hand, some some other things that may not be the case. Um, so, um, Yota, coming back to you, we, we've seen recently some quite interesting and and some would say fairly creepy examples of um, what what's called deep fake technology. That's you know mimicking the looks, the sound, um, and and the mannerisms of a person. Um, and and this can do all sorts of things. We can synthesize voices. We can replace faces, we can alter lip movements uh, in picture. Um, away from the misuse of that technology, do you see that same technology as, as beneficial in localization? It certainly has a very disruptive uh, potential, uh, especially in dubbing. Um, so um, everyone, I guess, or a lot of people here will have seen the deep fakes of Tom Cruise and Obama. And what happened in those is one person's face goes another, uh, on top of another person's body. And then, as you said, uh, the flaps, uh, as we call them in the dubbing industry, which is the mouth movements, are synchronized to the audio. And this is how uh, David Beckham as well was made to deliver an anti-malaria message in, in line languages um, in, in 2019, right? Uh, so uh, there's, in, in terms of film production, we are, I'm not an expert, I guess, you know, huge entertainment value by bringing a famous actor back from the dead 
I suppose. But talking about where I'm an expert in dubbing specifically, uh, right now what, uh, what we do in dubbing is we spend an awful lot of time and effort in writing script adaptations, uh, so translating the script uh, in a way so that when we record, the sounds will be synced to the mouth movements, which are fixed. So we have to make the translation to fit the visuals and the way the mouth moves. And that's really, really hard. It takes a lot of time to create this. With this technology, we could actually, in theory at least, do the opposite. So uh, translate, have a fantastic translation, but without thinking about flaps, uh, record the audio more freely and then sync the mouth movements to the audio you've recorded instead of the other way around. Uh, but this um, you know, is not something that we can just do right apart from the ethical issues in this there's also legal issues so for instance i guess we would have to alter um, actors contracts uh, so that you know they permit such modifications to their facial expressions when a film is dubbed in another language and this may be perhaps easier with lesser known actors for tv productions but maybe not as easy with the big uh, hollywood names and then on the, on the other side, we have the voice cloning that you mentioned, where you have one voice transformed into another. And again, uh, Barack Obama is used very frequently, his voice is used frequently to uh, showcase this technology. Uh, so the applications there for dubbing would be um, a lot, you know, to, when an actor becomes unavailable, you can still record. You don't have to call someone back to re-record lines if there's a, a, an error. Um, you, you can make recordings with children easier. I mean, the recordings with children take a lot more time. It's a lot more difficult to schedule. Um, you can add an accent to a voice. You can restore audio from uh, old materials that have been damaged. I haven't really heard them used in dubbing workflows yet. And um, I, I was just working on a large project on dubbing. So I've been talking to a lot of people about these technologies. Uh, and many think voice cloning is still far off from media localization workflows. Uh, my opinion is that it's probably nearer than we believe. Um, one of the uh, companies, for instance, that's producing such a voice cloning uh, technology um, was talking about the possibility of taking one actor's voice and then manipulating into multiple characters, multiple voices. And that's a big thing in dubbing. You, you frequently need to uh, have you know, you have to have many actors and then you have the secondary actors. So you can have an actor have multiple roles. So given the pressure uh, in the market uh, for more cost effective workflows and also the work is increasing, I think some experimentation is bound to happen sooner rather than later. Of course, you know, maybe with secondary actors with, you know, in maybe in gaming first rather than in you know, uh, blockbusters or something like that. But I think there will be experimentation. For well, this is the, you raise an interesting point there. Um, and, and I have actually just seen a question uh, from Tim Marshall as well, asking about, um, you know, how long is it before the machines get to that last 2%, um, you know, the way in which they're learning. Uh, I, I personally would argue that the, the last 2% isn't about learning more. It's probably to do with context, um, which is something that's bigger than just learning from a bigger data set. Um, but uh, on, on that score, um, you know, is, is perfection the enemy of good or good enough? Um, in, in, Giannis, do you see that um, there's a trend to, to like, you, once you reach a certain bar with an AI, that's good enough, deploy it, get on with it, um, you know, or, or are we trying to aim for something better than that? Yeah, these are very good questions, all of them. Uh, on the 2%, I fully agree with you. And I want to add on top of it that exactly because of what you're saying, the context and the difficulty to model that in, in deeply deep semantics and all of these things, uh, every fraction of a percent in that, loop, in that 2% is exponentially harder to get. So it's not a linear, you know, it's not like we're going to gain half a percent in a year and so on, right? Uh, it, both for machines and for humans. Um, you know, me as a non-native speaker, for example, of English, right? There are contexts that I will struggle to get as a non-native speaker as well, right? Um, now, coming to the issue of software, um, yes, so I mean, uh, my personal view is that uh, what we call AI and neural uh, engines and inference is just another software layer, which is uh, one layer of abstraction above what we used to do. 
So you, if, you talk, if you take, you know, uh, atoms, uh, silicon, uh, integrated circuits, microcode, uh, assembly code, low level languages, you know, structured languages, scripting, semantics, and then on top of it, we now have, you know, data driven software uh, authoring in a way, right? Because a neural network is essentially a piece of code that was written by a structure that was tuned based on data, right? And in every one of these layers, we are always adding controls. So we're always adding functions that will check for these periphery corner cases as we discussed, right? And the danger of AI is that there is a lot of hype. And, and as you say, there's a race for, for money, a race for impact, a race for dominance in the sector and so on. And also different countries have different standards. Maybe some countries are a bit more opportunistic than others in pushing to product. You, you know who I may be referring to in different cases, right? Um, so then what happens is that uh, it's, it's up to every, you know, every system, whether it's a company or whether it's a government or whether it's us as citizens, to demand certain quality levels and certain standards, right? or us as customers also. Um, and I would say that, uh, in fact, I think the good uses of AI and neural networks will actually improve software because we will be much more aware of always demanding, uh, you know, these checks, always demanding these fixes, while a lot of traditional handcrafted software has hidden bugs that uh, sometimes are a lot harder to find because we just think, oh, that's a simple piece of code and we don't need to check it, right? A simple example is, uh, I'm sure you may know the example, right? Uh, there have been, uh, take a simple sorting algorithm that sorts numbers, for example. There have been books published for decades which included uh, sorting algorithms with bugs. Why? Because as data sizes grow, we now realize that you know these uh, pieces of code were not checking for overflows when you were reaching the maximum, you know, two to the power sixty-four, for example. Which at the time nobody cared because you would never sort, you know, two to the power sixty-four numbers. But now it's almost even mobile phones would do these things, right? So it's a lot of the software quality has to do with the level of sophistication of our tools, the data growth. And in fact, AI, I would say, because we're aware of the problem, we have a heads up to fix it and have it have less impact than what it could uh, do. That's a really good point. And, and actually coming uh, or thinking about that, um, it, you know, well, on a lot of levels, is, is, it's really a question of making that choice to actually um, to, to do that, to raise the bar of quality. Um, if on, I mean, and again, kind of coming back to this kind of threat, I guess, of things like deep fakes and so on, and, and we live in this so-called post-truth world, um, you know, are broadcasters, um, news agencies, content aggregators keeping up with um, what they need to invest into, for instance, combat fake news? I know that's an area that, you know, AIs are deployed in to try and prevent trolling and things like that. Is that something you're seeing uh, coming directly from those um, those broadcasters and so on, or is it government driven? What what's that landscape look like? Um, so I think the first is really interesting. We use AI to create fake news, but likewise to detect fake news. So um, it's it's also about the training data. That's quite important, um, and especially in the news area, which need to be extremely reliable. Um, so this is not about entertainment, this is about facts and figures, and that needs to be right and informative to people. Um, we need a, a quite of a wide range of training data, and just to come back to Yotta's problem, of course, the machine will know, need to know um, how uh, Barack Obama looks like and the way he speaks or his mimics are, um, just to detect if, if there's some fake news. But likewise to maybe a local politician or any local um, environment and things happening, obviously. So I think that's that's really the first challenge. But obviously, uh, again, also coming back to broadcasters and news, that's a very reliable source. And therefore, it's extremely important. News are right. 
and fake news don't find a place and in their evening news, obviously. Um, there are a couple of examples um, being used, especially for social media as well. I think social media is, is, is another area that's quite important and um, that broadcasters obviously also contribute to. Um, so there's Fabula AI, for example, which is being used for Twitter. Um, so there's a very specific niche field to train the AI to detect those fake news. But there's also a study from Microsoft and the University of Arizona who, who actually leveraged the engagement um, in social media and, and detect the signals um, to detect the fake news as well. So I think you have to talk to the guys for, for all the details, um, what magic they're doing to it. But, but certainly um, there are experts in the fields who are dedicated to, to detect this, yes. That's good to know that there's definitely some effort going into that. Yeah. Um, I, I've seen a few questions coming in, so I'm going to just quickly um, and jump to them. One of them actually um, uh, uh, coming from Ralph Brown is, could AI reduce the costs of transcoding for multiple bit rates for real-time streaming? Uh, I'm, <laughs> I'm going to do some advertising on behalf of Yanis and say that iSize uh, who Yanis uh, is the CTO of, uh, do exactly that. So without starting to make this into a big advert, we could, you should probably go and have a look at the work that those guys are doing, uh, which is exactly in that area. And uh, um, maybe maybe don't need to dive into that now, Yanis, if you don't mind. Um, I've done I've done your marketing for you. I'm not I'm not getting any backhanders, by the way. There's no might be a beer in it for me later. Um, Tim Bull. Uh, asks if, uh, well, he says uh, deep fakes can be used for good, e.g. bringing a dead actor back to life. Deep fakes can also be used for bad, e.g. spreading propaganda and disinformation. Who decides when it's okay to use deep fakes? Who makes the rules? Well, that, that's a really interesting question. And certainly, you know, where we've seen uh, dead actors coming back to life in some of the, the bigger movies, such as Star Wars recently, I know that Disney consulted closely to, with the family of the actor before they did that. They didn't just go ahead and use those people in the film. Um, so certainly there's a big responsibility there. Um, uh, why, um, I think that opens up a bigger question about AI, which is that there is risk attached to it. Um, and, and it can be used like any technology for good or for bad. Um, so I'd like to just ask the whole panel in that case, um, what are some of the risks that you see with AI as we have it today? And uh, whoever wants to go first, y Yotta, your, your mic's open, so you could go first. Yes, why not? Um, well, uh, in my case, you know, the, the risk is very obvious with synthetic media and it's already been uh, brought up. Uh, you know, we've seen examples of what can go wrong. You know, you can... Uh, effect there is influence the result of elections. You can have conspiracy theories going wild. You know, you can have bias reproduced um, through the data that machine translation systems are being trained on. And these are probably minor in what can actually happen if AI is not deployed responsibly and in a robust and transparent uh, manner. So for synthetic media, I believe that basically, of course, there's a need for very good deep fake detection technology, but I think it's also should be obligatory to have clear labeling of synthetic media going forward. There's a legislation has a lot of role to play here, I think, uh, to safeguard us from any potential misuse of technologies and, and so that we ensure that technology will only be used in beneficial uh, ways, the stronger and the more powerful uh, technology is, the higher the risk and we have to be proactive. We can't learn from mistakes, in my opinion. I know there are ethical, I'm not an expert on this, but I know there are ethical guidelines that have been published for the use uh, of AI, both by governments and by businesses. I know the UK government published uh, in 2018, I believed, um, guidelines. Uh, so I guess in my, my mind, all we, what we have to do is not easy, but what we have to do is to make sure that they are followed through and we have the right legislation in place to implement these guidelines so that we avoid this misuse and you know, we can shape the future with technology in a way that technology still serves us and it reflects our you know, values, our objectives for what we want our future life to be. 
that's a very general answer, but yeah, that's all I've got on that topic. Yvonne, what, what do you think about this? I also saw that someone was asking about reducing bias in the, in the training data, which is a really interesting question there. Um, and, and that definitely, I would say, contributes to one of the risks. Well, what's your thought on that? Yeah, so first of all, uh, would totally agree with Yato's uh, comment. That's one of the highest risk, um, misinformation and, and misleading um, data, um, obviously. And I, th I think we can solve it when we all work together because the training data or the, the yeah that AI and machine learning systems rely on obviously needs to be of high quality and it needs to reach a critical mass. So if everybody in the world would actually contribute to a huge system and collecting data that's being referenced and verified, then obviously that would be the perfect solution to it. Um, unless you want and need regional data, which might just be an interest to you and nobody else is interested to contribute, to verify that data or to even to create that data. Um, obviously, I think that the biggest threat um, that could, could happen um, overall, not just to our industries, if we avoid those ethical discussions. Uh, we've seen what happened to the internet. Um, we haven't had those, those discussions about the ethics and what could go wrong with the internet. I think nobody could imagine possibly. So uh, there are lots of, I would say, horror movies um, and series out there that, that use AI and have some, some sort of a future vision, which is quite negative. Um, but I think this can help us to prevent us from going there. Actually, we need to have that debate. And I think this, this could be the biggest threat if we don't take this on board, really. Um, and what do you think, Yanis? Where, where do you see the threats, uh, or sorry, the, the risks uh, with, yeah. with AI today? All the threats, both. Yeah, I mean... Uh, risk of threat. <laughs> exactly. Uh, I agree with uh, both Yoda and Yvonne. Um, there is a risk of hype, as I mentioned earlier, that people like this unreasonable expectations about uh, intelligent machines and all of this stuff. And, and it's not going to happen exactly in the way that most people think. Uh, there is the risk of monopolies, uh, you know, AI expertise being concentrated in few companies around the world and even a few countries around the world. And then, you know, what happens after that, it may increase inequality, it may, con it may force many people in the industry to work with the limited set of partners that they have no choice because they are the ones that can deliver these services, right? Wherever these partners are. Um, and then I think, uh, what else I want to mention? Uh, there's the risk of limit cycles that I mentioned before. So putting AI to monitor AI or, or AI to detect AI and then these things getting out of control. Um, in, our, in the media industry, in the finance industry, all kinds of industries, right? Um, that's why having humans in the loop and the slow passage, of what I call the slow passage of physical time, meaning that in certain circumstances, it is beneficial to slow things down and not let things roll out of control very quickly, right? Um, yeah, I think that's kind of my summary. So... Uh, I want to look a little bit at the, um, you know, where we're going in the future. We've got um, about 20 minutes left. Um, so I want to sort of dive into where, where we're going with this. And, and actually coming back to something that you mentioned a couple of times there, uh, Yanis, around the, the hype uh, around it. Um, you know, we are, I, I think you, we, you could argue we're still taking early steps in the AI journey. We're cer certainly nowhere near what people might think of as that sci-fi version of AI, uh, a kind of an artificial general intelligence, which is self-aware, self-conscious, or, you know, gone out of control and uh, like, the t well, I, I think people tend to think of the Terminator as an AI gone wrong, but it's actually, as far as I can tell, it's an AI doing exactly what it was supposed to. Um, you know, it's, it's perfectly functioning, it's meant to kill all, all of humanity. So it's, it's, it's been fit for purpose, in fact. Um, but, you know, there is this notion of AI, as you said, running out of control, and it may be subtle and small to start with. Um, but, you know, we, is this really the next technological revolution or is it is it just hype? Is this a bubble? Are we really 
you know, we, we can see there are applications here, but are we kidding ourselves that we're going to somehow get to that kind of, uh, you know, future that we see in the movies? And I mean, I don't know who wants to go first with that. I'll put you on the spot. Bear in yeah. mind as well, we'll all have been like wiped out in the in the robot apocalypse. So we, whatever you say now doesn't matter too much. Yeah. Look, uh, I, I wish I could answer all these questions, right? Uh, I, I would have a few more digits in my bank account if I had all the answers. <laughs> <laughs> so what, what I would say from what I know, right, and from in the interactions we have with larger companies, with several stakeholders in the sector, in academia and, and uh, industry, um, there are risks, as we said, there are massive opportunities. Um, I don't think what we call AI today in 10, 20, or maybe 30 years, it would not be called AI. It would be called just feature extraction using trainable software, or I don't know, something like that. If you look back at the pioneers of AI, right, uh, or the notion of AI, you know, John von Neumann uh, and several others, when they started the first AI conferences in the 50s, they talked about logic and, and you know, creating higher orders of logic in a, in a kind of an automatic way, eventually reaching semantics and, and, and logical associations, you know, which are self-constructed and all that. Uh, it, it, the part of vision and sensory um, acquisition, so understanding audio, understanding vision and so on, they thought it's a job of an intern, like it would take six months or a year for someone junior to do, right? Because of the technological naivety of the time, if you like. Uh, it turns out that part of extracting understanding from raw data feeds, whether they are audio, video, and so on, uh, it's massively complicated and we are still just dubbing with it, right? Uh, but that's what AI does today, basically. It can map complex, high dimensional, raw, noisy data into some feature space that we can manipulate easier. But the logic of what we do with that, it's still mostly handcrafted. We don't have you know, higher order logic systems that are self-learnable and self, which is what you would need to go to a machine that can be more um, autonomous, learn new tasks and so on. Reinforcement learning, which is, you know, deep mind and equivalent type of, of systems that one can call closer to an AI system, right? And it is indeed a form of primitive AI it is known in neuroscience that reinforcement learning is used, for example, for balancing tasks and so on. But my neuroscience colleagues at UCL and elsewhere, they assure me that uh, higher level um, brain functions are not reinforcement learning based. We don't know exactly what they are, but they're not just using reinforcement learning, right? Um, so I don't think we are at risk of any kind of massively damaging uh, situation, except of what we mentioned. But of course, I will let others comment because there are different views here. Yotto, Ivan, what, what yeah, do you think I, about this? Is it all I, hype or are we heading in that sci-fi direction? Well, for me, uh, I guess I'm not the right person to answer this question. I've actually been reading, uh, and there has been a survey of scientists uh, recently uh, to say what they believe will happen, and they're actually you know, the experts. So they, apparently they, the, the, mass, the majority believe that the AI will be able to write a best-selling book by uh, 2049. Uh, if that <laughs> means something, I don't know. Uh, but when I'm asked specifically about translation, which is where I am an expert, um, you know, when machine translation was started all those years ago, they said it was going to be a finished problem within five years. And, you know, <laughs> it's several decades later and it's nowhere near a finished problem. And when translators, young translators ask me about actually even getting into the profession, um, I do tell them that, you know, if they're just getting into it, then the best they should expect the job of a translator to change more and more, but there will still be a need for a human because uh, the, the machines don't understand language. You know, they're just, uh, it's, it's in a way, it's all statistics, right? Uh, statistical representations. They don't understand why this word goes after this and what it even means. They don't understand, um, rules they don't know grammar they actually don't know anything about language is 
a bit scary if you think about it, given that the output is as good as it is, actually. Yeah. Uh, so the world context, the humans will bring that, I think. The machines won't have that. I mean, it's hard enough these days. One of the problems that is being solved is getting document level context. So for instance, if a person is referred to in the previous sentence and her name is Mary, then you know that the, 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 you, know, you have to apply a feminine ending in a word in the next sentence. And this is where the research is right now. But I don't think translators will be out of a job. I, I often tell people, you know, first doctors will be out of a job and then us. So <laughs> that's my answer, a non-scientific one. Okay, that's no, a good answer. It's a good answer. Yvonne, what, what are your yeah, thoughts? Exactly. Yeah, I was just going uh, to say, I think it's a pretty good answer. It's um, AI seems to be a bit of the holy grail at the moment. Um, it's, it's the solution for everything. Um, but exactly for that reason, um, and to come back to my very first um, comment, what's the definition of AI? It's this range from a very simple algorithm and what Yotta described. So the machine is actually pretty stupid, doesn't know anything. And so what we teach them is basically advanced mathemat mathematics and statistics. But we haven't reached a level where it's becoming this intelligent um, system that will take over the world as, you know, there's those the, 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 the vision of it. And I think it's not really a revolution. It's probably an evolution, it will happen in steps. And at some point we will reach this super intelligence, um, maybe if we want them to let, to come to that point. But again, if we have this ethical discussion and train the machines with specific rules, I think um, it will just help us. So I don't see any negative future for it. Yeah, you've reminded me of a, an email I got sent by one of my uh, colleagues who was a developer working on some of the AI that we were building and they sent, they sent to me, I think it was a picture of, the, of, a, of a simple mathematical formula and it said 1990 statistics, 2020 AI. So yeah, I mean, it was the same formula. Uh, so yeah, we, you're right. I think that, that there is a good point there that, you know, what we're dealing with now is it is really like complicated maths, but it's it's not more than that. It's not consciousness as we might understand it. Um, I, I want to ask, uh, I think, what what is an important question that, that goes way beyond the media industry um, for sure um, as we as we start to like come towards the end of this. Um, but I think it's, it, this one is one that I, for certain I think about a lot and, and I, I, I would almost say it keeps me up at night a little bit. Um, are we pursuing commercial advantage ahead of ethical considerations with um, machine learning, deep learning, AI? Um, are marginal gains in speed or cost and efficiency, et cetera, sufficient to see a manual task being replaced uh, by an AI that's sort of good enough? Um, and and, are we, and, and in, in that, are we also maybe forgiving machine mistakes more readily than we would give, forgive a, a human those same mistakes? I don't know if anyone wants to jump in and answer. That's a very deep ethical question. I'm really sorry. It, it but really go on. Yeah, I think it really is. And it's probably, we would forgive a human to make mistakes, but probably not the machine. So I, I think we have quite high expectations if a machine is working and needs to provide the, the results that, that we expect, isn't it? Um, but again, I think it comes back to the same um, question for him. Yeah, uh, problem that we have with the internet. We need to have those ethical discussions, and um, you know, it's, it's it's often being misused, obviously. And there's always this balance between the good and bad. Um, but um, the, the the commercial aspects to use AI are super important as well. And um, I've said that at the beginning. Obviously, monetization and becoming more efficient in the way we work is one of the drivers, obviously. And we will likely see a shift in, in the human tasks that we're doing in our job uh, roles, um, but it doesn't mean we're being replaced by machines. Maybe some of the jobs will be those routine jobs, but actually I think we humans still have a place and I want, want us to have a place actually. What do you think, Yata? Do we do we need to protect ourselves from that, or is this something that naturally 
it's the same as any other technological evolution that, that maybe certain jobs get replaced but new ones are created i think the latter and actually um as much as uh, you know at some point uh, you know, seamstresses you know stopped ex- you know, there was tons of seamstresses and now there aren't that many because it's all done by machines but you still have people that so, and these people are, tend to be the very specialized ones, the crafty ones, the higher value ones even. So, you know, if a machine reaches a level where it does a job just as good, not good enough, just as good as uh, the human that does it, then yes, that job will be replaced and that human will probably grow into doing something else. I don't see it as a replacement, I see it as growth, right? I mean, I see translators becoming more like, cultural consultants and advising the content owners as to, I don't know, what would sell, how they could sell in a specific country rather than just translate word for word if a machine can do this. So I see an evolution and it's also, it's a business reality, right? You know, if you can get a machine to do the job just as well, of course you will use it. Uh, um, Then, but then on the, on the, because you, you said good enough uh, in, in media localization uh, with entertainment content, it can't be good enough because you're trying to entertain. Otherwise, we wouldn't be, you know, spending millions to shoot films. We would just shoot a film using uh, our phones and we'd call that a film. That's good enough. <laughs> but no. So, you know, for localization as well, it has to be really good. Uh, maybe the good enough can be when uh, not replacing a service, but maybe creating a service when there isn't one. Just to give you an example from from my space, uh, in a lot of countries, there's hardly any live subtitling. Uh, So if there isn't any, then to have speech recognition as it is with the 2% errors, but clearly labeled that it's automated, it can have errors, so it's not manipulating uh, anyone, um, then yes, have it for a hundred percent of the programming. It would help. Uh, it would help the, uh, you know, the, the hearing impaired. Uh, it could potentially, and which potentially, by the way, is all of us as we grow older and our hearing yeah. deteriorates. Uh, Very good point. So yeah, why not have it? So I'm, I'm all for that. In that, I'm not sure if I agree with Yvonne about whether we forgive machine errors or not. Actually, I think. Maybe it's just me, but I was tending to forgive machine errors more than human errors because, and maybe in translation, translators were up to a point because we thought we, we forgive someone when we think they're dumber than us. And until now, machines have been dumber than us. So in machine translate, it was like, ha an error. Uh, the machine made this. But if this error was made by an actual professional translator, you'd be angry that a colleague of yours made such an error. <laughs> I don't think we will keep forgiving machine errors if these errors actually have an impact on our lives. So that's where I think it will, will draw the line. That's a very good point. Uh, Yanis, uh, we, quickly, can you give me a quick view on your, your thoughts about ethics and, and use of AI? Yeah, I mean, uh, to, I agree with the previous comments. I don't think uh, jobs are at risk as much as, you know, more repurposing uh, and finding even better jobs for people, right? Um, the, also, let's not forget people can be retrained and redeployed, right? Doing that as quickly and as efficiently and as agile uh, with an AI system is not, is not trivial, at least not today. Um, the other thing is, it's easy to do a prototype on, with AI. So write the best-selling book example. Yes, you can put a team of people that will write a million books and one of them will become a best-selling book, right? But can you build a system that does that regularly? Like a human author can be a human bestseller, uh, author of best, a series of bestsellers, right? Um, and by that example, I mean, it's easy to prototype and impress. It's much, difficult, much more difficult, as you know, I'm sure, to productize and create a robust, solution that can actually deploy itself planet, uh, planet-wide, right? So in that sense, I think we are still premature and I would echo in the ethics uh, Yvonne's comments about the internet or the Linux operating system or other things that we need to avoid. It's not so much ethics. We need to avoid the danger of a beta product, which is not even a, a beta prototype that was designed for academic or early usages, suddenly becoming 
a product that we all have to stick with because TCP and the internet was not designed to be a usable commercial product. It was designed as an academic prototype for DARPA and universities. And now we all have to live with it because nobody took control to fix things early on, right? Uh, so that to me is a bigger commercial risk, uh, you know, along with all the ethics that come with it, of course. Yeah. Um, so we've got uh, just four minutes left. I, um, I wanted to ask one more question. I've seen another question come in uh, from Keone D'Souza saying, uh, which I think is also a really good question. Ah, and since it rivals my good question, well, well, I thought it was a good question. Um, I'm going to give you both questions and you can choose to answer one, but I want you to just answer one and try and give it back to me in one minute if you can. So here we go. So the first question, I won't tell you whose is which question, you'll have to just guess. Um, so one question is, uh, do you think that the introduction of AI and ML uh, will make us more or less creative in the future? And the other question, um, which is a bit more general, is uh, can you give me an example um, of a near horizon development of AI uh, that you're excited about or that you think will have a really big impact on the media industry? Um, so you've got one minute, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to force you to answer. So Yvonne, go. So I think um, colour correction is a pretty, pretty high topic to retain brands and uh, you know we, we know the coca-cola rat needs to be the coca-cola rat and, and obviously that's something where ai can help and i think being exciting to retain the, you know, the brand um i think it won't make us more creative or less creative it will just help us to be creative and have more time to be creative as i said again at the, at the beginning probably a rough cut is good enough to select um the rough editing and the highlights but we're the ones finalizing everything to to the needs human uh, yeah. enjoy that's very good so keeps us creative uh Yanis, what do you think yeah on both questions more creative uh, as long as we all learn how to program and, <laughs> and encourage kids to go back to the hacker culture of the 80s becoming more hands-on programmers and so on as the uk has a very strong tradition in this okay and on excitement, exciting future, I would say for us is reverse engineering human perception for VOD and live content. If we get closer to that, it's worth all the effort in the world, in my opinion. Cool. That's very good. And Yata, we've got one minute. Let's, let's yes. do it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I don't know if it's a big impact in general, but in my field, in the machine translation for uh, media industry right now, there's developments on controlling the length of the machine translation output. And that's uh, important because in media localization, length is a hard constraint, both for subtitling, but also uh, for dubbing. And the other thing that excites me, uh, it probably has a broader impact, is the combination of technologies. For instance, speech recognition, I said, is really great. It can be improved significantly if it's combined with speech recognition so that the speaker diarization is more accurate, which would have a knock-on effect on punctuation, capitalization, then speech recognition output in the same language, it would be a lot better. So I'm, I'm excited about things like that. That's very cool. Combining of AIs to make them better. That does start to sound like we're getting towards that sci-fi future a little bit. Um, well, thank you very much, everybody. Um, we're coming up to the end of the hour now. So um, I, I really want to say thank you very much for all of your answers. We Luckily, we managed to get through quite a lot of audience Q&A during the session as well. Um, and uh, I'm sure that uh, the, there will be more questions people will have. Um, so you'll be able to uh, get in touch with us afterwards if you <laughs> want to discuss any of that stuff. Um, so Sadie, back to you. Thank you. Uh, that was super interesting. Um, so thanks all and lots of different opinions, which is always good as well. So I uh, just want to finish off by uh, saying, uh, please look at the rts.org.uk website and the what's on page for our future events um, and also others from the RTS, uh, which most of you don't have to be a member to view. So but obviously membership is great as well. So put some funds in the poll. So thank you very much. Uh, have a great evening, everybody. And we'll speak to you soon. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Bye -bye. everyone. Thanks thank for the invite.